for being with us today, Fraser. We Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, sorry. Of course. <laughs> we joined here today for a practice example interview for the European Commission Support Center for Data Sharing. And in these next 30 minutes, we will discuss your work at CHECT and what it has to do with data sharing. I'm sure you yourself know, but to whoever, uh, to whoever is listening or watching this, we are joined by CHECT, a technology company that enables individuals and organizations to take full control of their own data. Their mission is to give people and organizations the ability to control and understand the value of their own data. And they believe that the adoption of self-sovereign identity, SSI, is the way to do so. Hence, they are building commercial models through a blockchain network and talk tokens. Now, I will be interviewing you today as part of the European Commission Support Center for Data Sharing. This is an initiative by the Commission to support the development of the digital single market. And our objective is to facilitate data sharing, that is transactions in which data held by the public or private sector are made available to other organizations for use and reuse. And we do so in a number of ways, either by researching, documenting or reporting about the data sharing practices, EU legal frameworks and access and distribution technology. The practices that we select are not only relevant to organizations, but often also imply novel models and overcome legal or technological challenges in an innovative way. We regularly interview data sharing practitioners like yourself for this initiative, and we capture these interviews in our collection of practice examples. Our talk today will be part of this collection too. I'd like to talk about the solution that you've built and your views on sharing data. But before we get into it, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, and, and again, thanks for having me. So I'm Fraser, CEO of Checked. Uh, so we built the company as of April of last year. <clears throat> um, prior to that, I worked probably for around six or seven years for Accenture. The last project that I led up was with the uh, World Economic Forum and the Dutch and Canadian governments building out the Known Traveller project, which was digitizing passports in an SSI concept, self-sovereign ID concept for international travel. Um, and before that, I worked with um, a couple of central banks, so the Singaporean Monetary Authority and the Canadian Central Bank on cross blockchain pay, um, payments where I co-authored a couple of patents. So a um, bit of a jack of all trades, but mainly focused now on over the last like three to four years on self-sovereign ID and uh, kind of blockchain payment space. Okay. And could you maybe introduce the company uh, that you currently work for? Yes, absolutely. So uh, as you kind of described at the top of the call or the top of the interview, like SSR uh, checked is building kind of payment rails or commercial models for self-sovereign ID. So self-sovereign ID is very much the idea that individuals should have control or portability over their data. So the ability to decide what they receive, what they share from and who to. And that who could be like a company, it could be an individual, it could be an IoT device, it could even be a virtual thing. So we're now starting to find in like the metaverse. Um, but basically like, because that data is now portable with the individual, actually it's very very difficult to kind of enable payments and commercial models for that data and that's basically <clears throat> the gap that we're looking to fill so the ability to release that data to individuals have them use it pretty much anywhere in the world for whatever industry and still have like an appropriate value flow tied to that and the main reason for kind of focusing on that space is myself and my co-founder spent about a year or two doing self-sovereign id sales going to private industry these are organizations that like they work with customers they typically have a lot of customer data and actually they they do have an interest in like improving user experience and the problem we hit with ssi pretty consistently was if i can't kind of create a commercial model for releasing this data then i just can't like it's it's not on my roadmap to do this without a commercial driver and that's effectively the kind of gap that we're looking to, to kind of solve for in uh with checked and um, so I think when we're describing ourselves now, it's very much focused on enabling data portability, but enabling specifically trusted data marketplaces. So not just like data in aggregate that can be used for studies, but like really important individual, like data specific to an individual that needs some assurance, needs some veracity to it, and therefore has kind of increased value over just like a single data point. Mm -hmm. And what kind of information would this be on an individual? like? where i yep. live uh, what my age is uh, what my uh, what, <laughs> what kind of products i buy like how 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 small or like how narrow or how wide is it um the latter like incredibly wide it could be anything down from like 
like we did on, or we were looking at on the known traveler project, like that was based around passports and boarding passes. So like really high trust data, it could be all the way down to a receipt. And an example there could be um, like going and buying something expensive, receiving that receipt as a credential into your wallet, being able to share that to your insurer and say like, I want this insuring immediately. And they can immediately update your policy and provide that straight back to you. So even though the receipt has like an extremely low value in terms of like what well, the physical piece of paper it's on and what you typically do with it, actually you can start to drive like material business value out of it and therefore drive more value in, into the receipt. So it, it's really broad, really, really broad. Um, even down to, we were speaking to um, a telco recently and one of the kind of ideas was like, obviously banks have a massive problem with telephone fraud and about the only one of the only companies that knows that the right phone number for an individual is the telco so therefore providing that out as a trusted attribute that the person can then share onto the bank and say like what like this is proof that i hold this number um means that we can start like reducing fraud so even though like yes you could give someone else your phone number the fact that it's come from your like utility provider suddenly has way more weight um so it's, it's really, really broad. And that's just when we're talking about individuals and that's missing off. Like if we start speaking about companies and business licenses and M&A and due diligence or IoT devices or virtual things. So it's super, super broad. Yeah, you already mentioned a, a few examples, which gives me an insight into um, your, your typical customers. Um, so you mentioned telco, but also insurance companies. Um, uh, what what is the spectrum there, and where are they based? Is it global? Is it Europe? Yeah. So the, the easiest and uh, easiest question to answer there is the last one. So global. Um, what we've actually done. So we're we're at the infrastructure layer. We're a network provider, pretty much. Um, and therefore, what we've done is we are working with around forty to forty two vendors, um, focusing on self sovereign ID worldwide. And each one of them typically covers like a specific geography, a country or they cover a specific industry or use case. And pretty much the tooling that we're building out of the network and infrastructure layer is usable by any of these organizations in any industry. Um, but these partners know their industry and their country and the regulations better than we ever could. So we're effectively partnering up with them to say like, look, we can bring this kind of capability to you. We can massively drive like adoption of self-sovereign ideas a paradigm and you get to focus on the industry that you already know and love. And so that could be anything from supply chain down to healthcare professional credentials to um, like KYC or even going into like Web3 metaverse community management stuff. Like pretty much the templating we're doing at the infrastructure layer is available across all of them. Um, so we're kind of revamping our website at the moment, but all of that is going to focus on like just the sheer breadth of the use cases that our partners can cover and that they're currently delivering on. And so I imagine it's a it's a custom made piece of technology for each uh, client. Um, it's not a, a platform for an individual uh, that they have control over, right? Exactly. So most of these organisations are go, uh, kind of got working B two B. So in a weird way, we're kind of B two B to B to C, where the C is like the customer is actually working with the end client. Um, so good examples are like one of our partners works on supply chain. Um, most of that is tracking kind of pharmaceuticals across that supply chain. So their end customer is actually the business that they're working for. Um, in other areas, some of our partners are building like healthcare credentials. And what this looks like is for say doctors or nurses in the UK, <clears throat> they can move their professional credentials between hospitals or service providers without having to present all their physical documentation anymore, like PDFs, paper anymore. So in this way, kind of, they're working for like a healthcare provider who is then working on behalf of like the ultimate end customer, which is the doctor or the nurse who's sharing that data around. So ultimately it's providing all these different kind of use cases that then focus in onto an individual and they can start kind of creating that value that way. Yeah, get it. Nice. Um, and then maybe a bit um, looking at it uh, from a different point of view, um, what would uh, what's what's the importance of having SSI and what would be the cost of not having it? Uh, I think we've probably already seen it. And to your last question, like, I mean, it's basically surveillance capitalism as the dominant like way of monetizing data worldwide, um, which has led to like 
everything. I mean, probably the worst examples are stuff like Cambridge Analytica, where that data is opened up in ways it shouldn't be. Or when you, another way of looking at it is the sheer number of breaches that happen on a pretty regular basis. Like um, I was presenting a web summit recently and then I could guarantee everyone that I spoke to, like it, in that speech was maybe a couple of hundred people had had their data breached at some point. Like it's almost guaranteed. And all of that is because of this model where like companies are in, incentivized to hoard data, aggregate it en masse, but also not really look after it that well either. Um, so I'd say we've already seen like the downsides of it, but uh, I think probably to give one final example there, like it's why the average person has over at least over a hundred passwords. Like that's probably one of the most, the easiest symptoms of something that's just completely broken. And the current best way of like getting through that solution is to have a password manager rather than look at the whole system and go like, this whole thing is broken as a whole. Like we need a new way of thinking about it. Um, and I think that like the the real benefits there like are, are m there's a lot on the user experience. So if I lean on that healthcare credential one again, like you've got doctors having to turn up, give their documents in. Maybe they can join a hospital in five days. Like realistically, all of that time has been lost, and they've had to physically turn up, waste their time, like travel, all this kind of stuff. And the hospital's not getting any benefit out of it. Like there's no one practicing. And then if you flip it into this paradigm, like all of that data can be shared digitally. It can be shared pretty much instantaneously, processed close to that as well. And suddenly you've got a doctor on the floor, like inside a couple of, well, maybe inside a day, where before it was taking a week. Um, and so true TRW, the company that's kind of building this out, they estimate there's around 100,000 doctor days a year just lost to that opportunity. So that's just one example where like the user experience and the business just just makes sense. Mm -hmm. But there's kind of even further, which is like um, obviously right now data is siloed uh, off in various different places, specifically for individuals. And some of the ways people get around this are like going to a credit bureau because then you can get like name, his like date of birth, like credit history, address, all that kind of stuff. But it's still missing off a load of other data that's like super, super interesting and potentially useful for providing a service. And so that example I gave earlier around like having a receipt directly from the person who sold you the good, which everyone's starting to like build a kind of halfway solution by using emails, which is really clunky, um, but then be able to immediately share that data off to someone who could use that data to offer you a service that's valuable to you. Like that can't happen right now because the data is basically stored in formats that just aren't workable. Whereas as soon as you move it into this kind of self-sovereign ID paradigm where the individual either gets a copy or control of that data and they can start moving it around in any way they see fit. It opens up like business opportunities that just aren't possible right now. Um, to go back to like the known traveler project, like the one of the, you could almost consider it like the project that superseded it was the IATA travel pass. And that was focused during COVID on combining passports, boarding passes, vaccine credentials, uh, COVID tests, and maybe PCR, um, sorry, passenger locator forms and combining those all into one place where the individual could hold them and share them off with like the border agent, the flight and like the gate agent, all that kind of stuff without having to present like five different pieces of PDF or paper to different people at any one time. So it just suddenly brought all that information onto one person, the individual who could share it in advance and just make the whole journey seamless. So I'd say like, yeah, I guess to summarize there's the dangers of what we have now, which is like a just a completely broken system uh, with like surveillance capitalism, data breaches, like ridiculous numbers of passport passwords and the benefits are like getting rid of all of that, plus being able to create brand new user experiences that just can't just that just aren't possible in the current data paradigm. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, I guess there are, there are companies like yourselves who are uh, doing the same thing, your competitors. Um, you look surprised, um, no? <laughs> uh, well, well, this is the thing. So um, I guess on the partner side, like we, we work with like these 40, 42 partners worldwide and each of them are going after specific kind of industries, verticals, countries. Um, weirdly, we've not found really anyone operating like in terms of enabling self-sovereign ID payments. Um, so a good, a good example would be like, there are other networks providing the decentralized ID capabilities like Sovereign. 
Um, so that's who historically a lot of our partners have worked with and our kind, our kind of main competitive advantage of them against them is going to be enabling those payments. Um, but so far, we've really not found anyone stepping into that gap, which has been really nice for us. Um, so the ability to like actually build these models out, drive value for these people, um, and just, yeah, we think it's going to have a massive effect on like the actual adoption of it if we can monetize this data. And effectively, it should solve supply side on credentials. Like it should mean that companies want to flood the market with these credentials and see what the value of them is. And then effectively, like, the demand side should follow on where it's like, okay, we've got all this data available to us. Like, what can we start building for it? It's really, really cool. So yeah, we're in a weird spot where like, we've got competitors in certain places in terms of like the decentralized ID capabilities, but blending that with payments still seems to be like a completely unique space for us, which is uh, really good for us. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, do you think it will change? <laughs> uh, I mean, like I, uh, two, other, yeah, I guess like yes and no. Like I kind of like, I'd, I'd love for more people to be kind of going in this direction because like ultimately where we want to go with this is we want to enable this paradigm. We want to enable individuals to have that control. And it's, it's almost like the philosophical end point of GDPR. It's like no longer just providing consent, but like you actually get to control and own it. Um, so I would love more people to be kind of going in this direction because what we found is that by talking about this in a commercial perspective, rather than like, a reg tech or privacy tech perspective is that companies open up. They're like, yeah, we want to like, we want to make better user experiences. Yes, we want to make revenue. If we can achieve both of those things using SSI, amazing. Like if we can increase like the opportunities for ourselves, like using the technology, we're on board. And so we found like conversations that like myself and Anchor would have had like back when we were doing more like sales before suddenly are a lot easier to have when you can go look there's a revenue potential for you here it justifies the investment you're going to make and therefore you you can embrace this paradigm um so i mean it's always nice to have a competitive edge but at the same time the more people go in this direction i think the better for I mean, it's a big goal but like society in general um and actually like moving ship stuff into the right where we think is the right direction nice yeah, it seems like a very, um, I think your customers will be happy because their experience is optimized. Um, um, your clients are happy because, uh, well, they can uh, turn in more revenue. But uh, are there also people that dislike your uh, technology, like counter voices? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So um, there's there's definitely a view or a historic view of like SSI, SSI should be this like pure, like ideological thing of, like everyone should just share data and it should be owned by the individual and like money shouldn't come into it. Mm -hmm. But it basically, which, which I can understand philosophically, but I think the problem there is it, it just ignores the commercial reality of like how that data came into being. Like someone has had to collect it, process it, make sure it's accurate. Like it's why, um, it's why as much as like credit bureaus can be demonized a lot, like they provide a really valuable service to businesses that are willing to pay for it because like typically the data they're operating is like fuzzy. It's not of great quality. It's coming from a load of disparate sources and actually it does need like bringing together amalgamating into something that's useful, like a credit score that can then be used for decisioning. So there's, there's one on the philosophical side, um, which is just like, it should be this pure thing. Um, I think the other side is like under the hood, we, we use crypto to, do what we do and there are some people that are just like okay we don't want to be anywhere near like crypto um which i can especially can understand after like the goings on this week with like ftx sbf like all that kind of stuff i think the nice thing for us is like we're using infrastructure that's been built out solidly like the focus for us is like settling in stable coins or even like if there are available cdbcs so it's really focusing on like enabling all of those so that like yes there's underpinnings of crypto but basically like it's for a very very deliberate reason um and it's using as far as possible like, ma making stuff stable making it like repeatable scalable all that kind of stuff and removing some of the stigma of like just crypto in general so it's why we don't talk about it that much is there's not really any reason to like it's part of the solution but it where we're aiming for is like it shouldn't be visible to anyone um, effectively, we'd be looking at fiat coming in one side, a load of conversion and movement underneath, 
and then coming out the other side in fiat again and no one should really need to worry about what's going on underneath yeah yeah got it um can we maybe talk about how good the uptake of SSI is? Because um, in the article that you mentioned that is on our website, one of the opinion pieces, uh, there is an argument made for um, increasing the uptake of it. Um, so why is it why is it bad and what can we do to improve it? Yeah, great question. And this is ultimately where Czech came from. So um, a lot of SSI right now is being driven by governments. So like EIDAS is like a perfect example of like legislation that's coming in or regulations coming in that is going to drive the adoption of SSI. Like, and it's kind of the extension of what was there before, which is like a very federated model, still very much owned by, by companies. And now I, I think it was as recent as the European Identity Cloud Conference. Like I think someone from the commission stood up and was like, it's going to be SSI. Like there are going to be parts of this that will be you will recognise as SSI, and that's a really big move. So you've got a load of like, I guess experiments or regulations coming in at the government level, but none of it's really driving private enterprise. And if you think about like, yes, you interact with like a government whenever you travel, whenever you get your passport, driving license set out, but like the reality of where you use your data the most is with private companies. Um, that's the biggest side. So. I think that's been, and that's really where we think the lack of like commercial models and revenue has come in. So I think that's why we're so enthusiastic about what we're building is we th think by turning this into a commercial proposition where like it is commercially viable, it can provide new products and services, and there's a revenue stream that makes all of this again commercially viable. It just completely changes the conversation from a little bit like when PSD2 came in and all the banks went, oh, we've got to build a load of APIs, like we, we hate this. And then everyone realized that it created this opportunity for open banking where they could create basically a service layer and user experiences that just weren't possible before. So if you're a bank with a great user experience, you can now aggregate other banks that are not as good and basically gain insight onto like how they operate and then offer services across the top. And I think SSI is kind of going through that same journey, which is like driven by regs. But as soon as you kind of enable the business benefit of it, actually, that's where things are really going to take off. And I'd probably say the, there's a second dynamic, which I've only recently realized, which is <clears throat> a lot of the SSI vendors are focused on like generic like workflow engines. Um, and there haven't been so many so far that have really like gone really hard into like specific product direction. Um, and so as opposed to like, like open banking, where you had people like really going in like one direction, like wealth management or like payments, like you haven't really had that yet so far in, in SSI. And I think it's just starting to come around where you're starting to get like companies that are more like product houses building up something that's going to go all the way up vertical through the stack between all the companies get the users on board and go after a specific like use case or vertical and i think that's going to change things really really quickly as well just because all the user experience and all the ecosystems will be pulled together in one and therefore it should just be able to go quicker but i think that's one of the other dynamics that i've only just recently seen mm -hmm. yeah, you already mentioned it a bit uh, but maybe as a final question um What's your vision for the future of Checked? Um, and uh, will we keep, continue to have siloed data? Um, I guess, so again, to answer your last question first, like, I think it's always going to exist, but I think our hope is that it's no longer locked in that silo and it's free to move. Um, easiest example of that with the sheer number of people who've tried to leave Twitter for Mastodon and are like, why can't I own my own content? Like, why can't I just like move this over to this place? and move my social graph with it like why is this such a headache so i think i think those silos will always ex exist because realistically companies need them it's why they exist in the first place but that data is going to become a lot more portable and a lot more usable and our argument actually is a lot more valuable because if that data can move to wherever it's consumable wherever it's needed actually suddenly the value of it is drastically higher than when it's just locked inside one vault um and then the focus for check so um, where we're at right now is effectively all the decentralized ID or SSI capabilities are built out. And now the focus is purely on payments and commercial models. So our focus for the next six months is get adoption built into um, our partners' technology stacks. So that's already started. So as we work through that, we'll obviously be in front of more clients, more industries, and it really should, the network effect should start. But really where we think it's going to kickstart is um, where the payments are enabled. So 
the ability for one organization to just start flooding the market with credentials because they know that whenever those credentials are used in the future, they can go and get paid for them. So I think that's going to be the, the big focus for us. And so kind of across that six to 12 month period, we're kind of just expecting the volume of credentials and payments to just hockey stick because if we boil it down to incentives, like anyone issuing data has an incentive to recruit anyone consuming it and anyone consuming it probably finds it cheaper than like scanning PDFs, paying on Fido to KYC people repeatedly. And so they've got an incentive to recruit as many people who are issuing that data as well. And we expect that to basically just become its own flywheel um, and really start accelerating people through. So yeah, I guess for us, it's like driving that volume of credentials and driving that kind of payment flow. But also we just want to see self-sovereign ID, self-managed ID, Web5, whatever you call it, just further, like ad adopted by way more companies worldwide. Um, and yeah, whatever we can do that with our partners to help is absolutely what we'll be up to. Curious to see it. So am I, <laughs> but really looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Fraser, I want to thank you for being with us today. Uh, it was really interesting to uh, to hear what it is that you do as checks uh, and what your view is um, on data sharing and how you monetize data. Um, so uh, thank you for now. Uh, our recording will be uh, online on our platform, eudatasharing.eu, uh, and we will be in touch. Fantastic. Thanks again, and uh, great questions. Really.